Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy awesome i'm alive um thanks for joining me on the podcast and it's a pleasure to be joined by dr sophie cox who is um a lecturer in healthcare te technologies at the school of chemical engineering at birmingham university where i did my undergraduate and um sophie welcome to the podcast Thanks very much for having me. Uh, great to be talking to one of our alum as well. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't particularly good at chemistry, but I did get through just. <laughs> well, hopefully that's, that's certainly no reflection on our, our chemistry school. <laughs> no, no, that was my ability. The chemistry school, like the chemical, chemical, uh, the chemistry school pulled me up much higher to much higher level than I would have been otherwise. So I loved yeah. my time there. It was great. Good to hear. It's amazing. So um, COVID-19. Um, like, and specifically protective equipment, what's, uh, what's the state of play at the moment? Uh, yeah, so I work uh, in our School of uh, Chemical Engineering and our Healthcare Technologies Institute, and really what we aim to do is bridge the gap between academic research, industry and clinical needs. So at the moment with uh, the COVID crisis, there has been you know, unique demands for personal protective equipment or PPE. And our kind of two main areas of focus are to improve the effectiveness of existing PPE, but also to rapidly um, manufacture uh, equipment that is in um, short supply. So our team are really experts in a manufacturing process called 3D printing. Um, so right. where you you make an object uh, layer by layer from a, a digital design and what I think is really great to see within the 3D printing community is a lot of volunteers stepping forward um, to answer these calls for PPE from uh, the NHS. Amazing. So many things to ask you there. Um, what, so if we don't kind of wind back, is there yeah, enough sure. is there enough protective equipment right now? in the NHS? Um, so it really, it varies across the country and um, obviously things are changing day in, day out quite rapidly. And I think it's really testing our, our existing supply chains. Um, so, you know, locally, some hospitals have better supplies than, than others. And um, sometimes they're well stocked and, and other times they're not. So really what yeah. we're trying to understand and other kind of members of the, the 3D printing community is, is where we can support that need and, and obviously speed is of the, the essence really here. Yeah, definitely. So is it down to each local health authority to, to kind of like, let's say stockpile the, the correct equipment or is it more of a kind of government level um, initiative? Or how, is it, how's, how have we got to the state where we're kind of like scrambling for equipment to protect the frontline healthcare workers. Um, so obviously some decisions get made at, at more of a national government level um, and then there's kind of local procurement that happens for particular hospital trusts. So they will manage their own procurement needs, but then also obviously filter up that demand um, nationally. Um, to kind of feed into the government establishing the relationships that we need with the manufacturers that we need. But there's plenty yeah. of uh, government initiatives to really um, bring the manufacturing community within the UK together to try and answer some of these challenges across PPE, awesome. ventilators, et cetera. Yeah. And you're finding the manufacturers, so the, the local UK manufacturers that are, are getting together to try and produce the equipment. Uh, yes, yeah, cer certainly. There's there's definitely been a call to arms um, nationally across the UK, um, especially within the 3D printing community. There's been kind of thousands of volunteers that have, have stepped forward, people that just have a, a printer in their own home, um, as well as, you know, several institutions like the University of Birmingham that are pulling together their resources 
um, donating yeah. them or committing them to, to support the NHS. Amazing. And for those that don't know, can you give us a little overview of what 3D printing actually is and yeah, how sure. from it you can produce a mask that someone can wear? Yeah. Um, so the 3D printing process kind of starts with the design. Um, so all of that design work gets done digitally, so on a computer, and what you produce is something called a CAD file, so a computer-aided design file. That then needs to be converted into a file format that the printer can read. And what all 3D printers have in, in common is that they manufacture in this layer-by-layer layer fashion. So what the printer needs to know is for each 2D slice, what does it need to produce as a, as a solid part? So we, we convert our CAD files into something called an STL file, so a stereolithography file, and that's essentially just 2D slices of our three-dimensional part. Our printer can then choose where to build each of those 2D slices, and each 2D slice is stacked one on top of the other until you've completed that, that kind of full three-dimensional part. Crazy, crazy. Yeah, so, and, and that's use, only the basics. <laughs> yeah, literally crazy. So you can use, so is it, can you use different materials the whole way through? Yeah, yeah so um, I guess with 3D printing, it's important to point out that we're not really talking about just one single manufacturing process here. There are lots of different types of 3D printing. Um, the one that I guess is the most common and, and is most kind of relevant to this discussion is something called fused deposition modeling. Um, so this is a process that is capable of working with plastic materials. So what you have in the 3D printer is a nozzle that's fed with a filament of plastic. So just kind of like a coil of plastic that gets fed into the nozzle of the 3D printer that then gets heated up so that the plastic becomes um, a little bit liquefied. Um, yeah. And then it gets deposited um, as a as a kind of filament onto the bed of the 3D printer and repeated in a, a layer by layer fashion. Amazing, amazing. How long does it take to produce something like a mask? Um, so we're printing, our kind of two main um, projects are printing face shields. Um, so, right. you know, there's, there's quite a few examples of these online and they have one of the components of that face shield is 3D printed, which is the headband. It fits around uh, the user's head and that, depending on which design you choose to print, uh, it takes a couple of hours. Right. And then so the cool thing, I guess, with 3D printing is that unlike mass production, same cost, but personalised. Is that right? Yep. So you're... Yep. So that's that's definitely a very big advantage of 3D printing is the ability to customise the design. And that really links into the, the other project that we've got going on uh, related to, to COVID. Um, so the, the kind of focus of that work is really around utilizing the customization advantage of 3D printing. So what we're doing is 3D scanning people's faces so we can get an exact replica of their facial profile. From that, we are then able to design a customized seal that will perfectly fit that individual person's face and we're designing that seal such that it can fit onto any generic face mask that's already been used in the NHS. So that gives us kind of two main advantages. Um, so firstly because it's customised it, it we hope it will provide a much better seal and therefore minimise exposure risks to the person wearing the mask. But also secondly and this is kind of something that's really being brought to light uh, as healthcare workers are using these masks more and more. So they're having to wear them all day. Uh, there's plenty of really dramatic um, pictures kicking around online now where healthcare workers are coming with uh, quite significant bruising. Um, right. So what we're aiming to do is actually print that customized interface to the mask in a flexible material to make the mask more comfortable and therefore to minimize any trauma or abrasion to the, to the face of the healthcare worker. So what's so what, like a silicon type? Yeah, exactly. Um, so pr printing in silicon uh, creates a little bit of a, a, you need slightly different 3D printer to be able to do that. So 
uh, silicon is a, a curing based um, polymer material. So you have to mix the silicon itself um, with a curing agent. So you need right. to have kind of two um, deposition nozzles that then get mixed together as you're printing in the process. So yeah. that work is all in uh, collaboration with some academics at King's College in London um, that right. have really pushed forward this uh, novel silicon printing technology. Nice. So the two projects you've got going on, so it's the the face masks and then it's the silicon uh, attachment, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. And so at what point at what point did you and the team start to to really look at this? Was it like what, four weeks ago, a few months ago? Like, what, When did the kind of COVID like thing filter into you? Um, so I think for us, it really hit home probably um, about a month ago and then we we sort of started working on both of these projects um, we've probably been working on them both for three weeks or so now okay. so with the the visors what we looked at initially was to manufacture them in a in a distributed way so luckily numerous staff and students had actually taken 3d printers home with them when the university closed oh, um, right. so we were able to kind of um you know get a picture of all of that capacity that was across kind of the local area um, and connect up those people and really begin in a, in a distributed way to make the visors um, the silicon project actually came the initial idea came from our collaborator at King's College. Um, so Professor Owen Addison, he's um, a professor of, of dentistry, but he holds a, a clinical appointment as well. And uh, so their research labs are actually based um, in a hospital building. Okay. And therefore, you know, having that connectivity between engineers and clinicians, that really helps us as engineers to you know, understand what the problems are and how we might be able to use our skills to, to offer solutions. Yeah, that's amazing. And were you, so did you just decide to start doing it or was there some government um, initiative to to start to get the universities and, and, and teams like yours on the problem? Uh, so we, we started it just initially off our own backs, really. So yeah. leveraging um, capacity that we already had within our research teams and getting special permission from the universities to be able to access the equipment that we needed. Um, so it was, it was great that both universities were on board supporting us, uh, kind yeah. of rallying our, our skills to, to achieve this. Um, there have been some rapid response calls come out. Um, from um, the UK Research and Innovation, so UKRI, which we have just uh, submitted to one of their calls to, to get some funding to, to really drive uh, the, the customised seal project forward um, even yeah. more so. Nice. And you're doing all of this while your team are working from home, right? Sounds like. <laughs> yeah, so the... Um, the, the the silicon project from our end has been done entirely from home um unbelievable yeah. which um is not usually the way we work um <laughs> but it's i think it's a great testament to technology really the the fact that we've been able to stay connected talk to each other regularly throw ideas around you know shared designs using sort of like a dropbox link so we can all be you know looking at different iterations and giving our yeah. input and stuff it's been um a real eye opener to the way that you can work from home for sure yeah is it going to change the way you and your team work do you think going forward um i think so i think it will it will better connect us i think in the long term i think universities are very big places and we quite often have to use equipment within different buildings or different specialised institutes and therefore quite often the team are dispersed across campus and we might you know bump into each other once or twice a day but I think this has really taught us the strength that you can get through collaborating and um, making sure that you're you're regularly communicating with each other so I think it definitely will change things hopefully positively in the long term as well yeah and have you been doing like daily video calls like this so zoom or google hangouts or whatever yeah, yeah. so we've been uh, using uh, zoom skype uh skype for <laughs> business you know all of the platforms have been um utilized 
um so yeah we'd, we try and keep in touch daily and yeah. um we use slack a lot which was something yes. we'd yeah. already um we'd already used uh, in the research group which we find really really useful for for sharing documents as well as ideas um and yes yeah, it's, it's been fantastic to kind of be able to pull some of our our undergraduate and PhD students more um, to the forefront of, of uh, this kind of cutting edge research, really. Oh, nice. So you've got them involved as well? Yeah, absolutely. As as the kind of concepts have sort of grown, um, particularly with the, the silicon mask, because there are various different types of masks that are being worn um, in terms of their design, how they fit to the face. We've had to think about different ways of adapting our concept to each of those masks. So some of them are much stiffer, some of them fold flat, some right. of them are now being 3D printed. Um, so we've had to kind of split up the, the different design concepts into different prototypes and therefore we've needed um, some more hands on deck as such. Um, yeah. Nice. So yes, it's, it's been fantastic. You touched on it a little bit, but um, so in terms of actually getting it to the front line, so it sounds quite fortunately you gave all of your team a 3D printer to take home when the lockdown happened, which is great forward thinking. So, so they're, so they're correct me if I'm wrong, so they're in different parts of the country, wherever home might be, probably servicing their local hospitals and, and communities. Um, I've always had the impression that it takes quite a while for something that's researched and, and dreamt up in the lab to actually make it into industry and manufactured and, and stuff. So, so what's what's been the process? It's been starting three weeks ago for this project. Are we are we starting to see it worn by our healthcare workers yet? Um, how can they get hold of it? You know, how, how's it actually going to come into into distribution now? Yeah. So I think the two projects we're working on are quite different stages. Um, so with the, the visors, that has been something we've been able to get out to distribution much quicker. So there's been a lot of the 3D printing community online. So manufacturers of 3D printers have um, been great at making their designs for these visors open source. And that's really sped right. things up quite significantly. Um, we're very lucky within our Healthcare Technologies Institute that we have significant expertise around things like disinfection, sterilization, how to make medical devices that are suitable um, to go to clinic. So we've been able to leverage some of that expertise that has really helped us not just answer the need, but also make sure that we're doing it in a robust way. So we've yeah. been able to have people manufacturing in their homes that then we do collections um, from those localized places, bring them into our uh, collaborative teaching lab, which is now set up on campus with a further 15 printers. And we use that as kind of a, a central point where we're manufacturing there as well, but we're also, we've got kind of a quality management system set up there. So we're doing quality checks. We're then doing the disinfection um, centrally to making sure that they're all up to a, a good standard before then they can be distributed to the uh, the trust of the, the local hospitals. Amazing. How many are you able to produce a week now? Uh, so the visors at the moment, our maximum capacity is about 100 a day. 100 a day, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And all of those so far are going to um, the University Hospitals Trust in Birmingham. So that covers the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and the yep. Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital. Okay, so they're all going there at the moment. And then yes, I guess, it, yeah, and then for the Kings, they're attached to Guy's and St. Thomas's, is that right? Yeah, so King's College is, is attached to Guy's and St. Thomas's, exactly. Um, so the because what we're doing with the mask seal is a little bit more um, novel, um, it involves kind of several steps of the process. So we're having to qualify the, the 3D scan data that we're getting. We're then having to do our own custom design work to design the, the seal initially. And now we're at a stage where we are prototyping the seals that we've made so far and looking at how well they fit onto the mask that they were designed to fit to. Um, so that's kind of at a prototyping stage currently um and you know like i said we've we've just submitted for some some funding um from yeah. ukri so if that's um successful then we can certainly 
hope to be moving this forward to distribution um, in the next few months, really. Great. And are they are they being quite quick now with funding UKRI? Yeah, certainly. The the turnaround time for reviewing of grants is um, normally several months, <laughs> um, right. but that but they've brought that down to um, to ten days or a week or so. So that yeah. the calls are much more rapid than usual. Great. And if anyone's listening that could fund your project are they able to do that yeah absolutely we do um the university's got a, a fantastic alumni team that manages um a lot of d donations um for our research projects um i've been very lucky to, to have funding from alumni in the past but we also accept charitable donations um for particular research projects as well cool well there's a lot of business leaders listening to this so if you are get on the phone and fund it because it sounds like a brilliant brilliant project how long will it take for the silicon then once funded to, to get out to the healthcare workers um so we're looking that project we've um currently designed as a nine month project and that would take us all the way through um to the point at which we could be scaling up the manufacture and have had regulatory approval on the sealed um so a little bit longer than the the visors, um, but like I said, it's it's um, there's several stages to the process, and obviously we want yeah. to be making sure that um, it's it's a good quality and it's it's able to to do what it says basically. Definitely. So do you envisage? Hopefully, COVID will be finished by nine months or so. But um, are, you, are you seeing then there might be a bit of a step change in 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 healthcare workers using protective equipment more now as a result yeah. of this? Absolutely. I think, you know, what we're doing with the silicon is much broader than just as a response to COVID. It's yeah. about improving the efficiency of our PPE. And obviously that will be critical to, to any um, future crises as well. Um, but it's also understanding how we can customize devices better and more rapidly because you can get so much more added value from from customized prosthetics or implantable devices so there's a lot of i guess basic scientific understanding that we're already beginning to to evolve as as part of that yeah. work really so Amazing. we're looking at that as kind of much more holistically um yeah Great. How effective are they? The masks currently? Yeah. Um, so they are pretty effective. Um, what what they have to do with the um, the higher specification masks, so these are the FFP3s, the, the worker has to go through a fit test. Um, and as part of that fit, fit test, they do assess the, the seal of the mask. Um, what we're really looking to improve there is to speed up the time that it takes for that fit test to be done, but also it's about the, the comfort and reducing the trauma to the healthcare worker if they're having to wear the mask for such a prolonged period of time. Okay, so it sounds like with 100, 100, develop, 100 produced a day, we need to try and enlist as many other 3D printers as possible to really get every healthcare worker one of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think it's been great to see the response from the 3D printing community. It's It really does highlight the value of having distributed manufacturing capacity because we can more rapidly respond to, to local needs. And I think a big thing moving forward will be how do we make our manufacturing capabilities more resilient um, such that we can respond to these um, rapid healthcare demands. Yeah, amazing. Well, look, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to uh, to educate us on this and uh, keep up all the good work. It's great to see our universities um, like pulling together uh, in times of crisis. Perhaps the silver lining uh, amongst all of this is the country pulling together a little bit and, and working towards a common goal. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. I think having a positive mindset on um, what we can learn and how we can move forward as a as a country is is great. I would just like to say uh, give a big shout out to all of the research team behind both of these projects, which has included several members of staff and several students uh, all across the campus. So they've been really working hard and uh, coming together.
which is fantastic Definitely. to see. Well, what, what we'll do once we start um, distributing the podcast online, um, we'll tag all the people that are part of it so they get some recognition. Um, awesome, thank you. Yeah, keep up all the good work. Lovely to speak to you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.